Hello. Uh, thank you all for coming today, uh, and welcome back to the Hudson to the excuse me, the Hudson to the South Pro Senior Center, where I'm sure you have been many times. This is the first time I've never seen it open all the way. I didn't realize you had this kind of really huge, like big space. This is great. So. Uh, my, for those of you who haven't been here before, my name is Arthur Bergeron. I'm an attorney. I work at Myrick O'Connell. Uh, there are 60 of us, 40 in Worcester and 20 right across the street in Westboro, over on the other side of Route 9. Uh, everybody else there does something else. I do this. What I've liked about being at Myrick is that I get to just do elder law, uh, which often people say, well, what is that exactly? And I said, elder law is law designed for people who have about retired and they want to make sure, A, they don't go broke before they die, and B, after they die, their money goes where they hope it's going to go and not to the government or to somebody else. So that's elder law. So today is Elder Law 101. I do uh, uh, four presentations a year here at the Council on Aging, and once every year I just do an update, which is the kind of basics of elder law. There are some things that have changed this year, and so I'll, I'm going to incorporate that in the presentation. Uh, and for those of you who've been here, you know that my my presentations are always about my friends Frank and Mary and their children, Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. They have, their lives are very simple. They want to live in their house until they die. They want to be buried in the backyard. If one of them dies, they want to leave everything to the other. If they're both dead, they want to leave everything to their kids. Does any of this sound like a familiar plan? So this is not an uncommon basic plan. So we're going to talk about Frank and Mary. Um, oftentimes, these folks will come in to me uh, to talk about, oh my God, I haven't done anything in you know, 100 years or do I, you know, what, do I really need a will? What do I really need? Don't I need a will? Don't I need a trust so that I don't have to go through probate? And we'll talk about those. Um, but one of the things I try to emphasize for them is that given the plan that I just described for these two people, that is, when one dies, everything goes to the other. When the two of them are dead, everything goes to their kids. They actually don't even need a will because that's exactly what would happen if you owned assets and you died and your spouse were alive, the, then the, the state law is everything goes to the surviving spouse unless there's a will. And that if there is no surviving spouse, everything goes to the kids unless there's a will. So there may be some reasons why you don't want that to happen. And we're going to talk about that for a little, in a little bit. But the main thing is, in that situation, you actually don't need a will. This always amazes people that I say this. They'll say, but if I have a will, don't I avoid probate? Well, the answer to that is no. No, you, you avoid probate by not owning anything when you die. That is, not having anything that is just in your name. If there's something in just your name, then the probate process is, is meant to figure out who then owns it. Because when you died, it was just in your name. If you own something jointly with somebody else, then upon your death, your interest evaporates and they become the sole owner. Uh, if you own a life estate, often this happens in real estate, Upon your death, your interest evaporates, and so the remaining people, called the remainder men, become the sole owners. Um, but probate is designed to, make sh to figure out what happens to property that you own when you die. If you have a will, then where the property goes is what, whatever is said in the will. If you don't have a will, then there are these rules of intestacy, that is the rules that apply when there is no will, and that's the rule. Among other things, one spouse dies, goes to the other, both spouses die, goes to the kids. So what do you really need as documents, as a person who is getting older? You need, and by the way, these are their assets. These are Frank and Mary's assets. They own a house. It's not a real big house, $300,000. Um, he has an IRA worth 150. They have an annuity worth 100. Uh, and they've got joint savings of about 75. Uh, their income, he earns $2,000 a month, $1,500 a month from Social Security and, and uh, 500 from a pension. She, owns ha she earns half of his. She gets his social, you know, half of his social security check or 750. So we're going to be kind of talking about that basic layout. Now there's some other issues that may have an effect on you. If you have total assets worth more than a million dollars, um, then you may, th then there are some estate tax consequences to that and you may want to plan around that. We're not going to talk about that today, just so that's kind of like Elder Law 102. You know, that's kind of the other issues. But that's basically the situation. In that situation, these are really the only documents that you have to have. You absolutely have to have. You have to have a health care proxy, a power of attorney, and a MOLST. Raise your hand if you know what a MOLST form is. Ah, one person, that's about typical, that's about average, <laughs> about 5% of people know that form. The MOLST form, and we're going to talk about it a little bit more, is Medical Orders for Life Sustaining Treatment. M-O-L-S-T is the form that has replaced and is replacing the so-called DNR form, but it's much more comprehensive. We're going to talk about that. So first, healthcare proxy. 
You have to have a healthcare proxy. Yeah, I mean, you have to have a healthcare proxy at any age. You really have to have it once you get to be our age. I get to count myself as part of you here. I'm now 66. I had to actually figure out applying for social, or social, do I want to apply for Social Security, Medicare? I'm with you on this. It's very confusing. But the bottom line is um, you have to have a health care proxy because if you are disabled, if you have a stroke, if you get into an accident, if, if for some reason your doctor says you can't make a medical decision, there is nobody legally who has the right to make that decision for you. Not your spouse, not your kids, nobody. Now doctors and hospitals have traditionally given people a lot of slack on that and been willing to accept the, 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 the opinion of the spouse or sometimes of the kids, except with the kids, the problem is a lot of times they're disagreeing, right? Regarding what the medical treatment is supposed to be if you're disabled, they're not supposed to do that. That's, they're not supposed to do that. And any doctor could legitimately say if you're incapable of making a medical decision, if there is nobody that you've named to make these decisions for you, go to the probate court and get a guardianship, right? Incredibly expensive and especially time consuming. That's the big issue. So you have to have a healthcare proxy. And you're all going to tell me, oh, I signed one of these when I went to the hospital, right? You went to the emergency room, you had some reason, you went to the hospital, you signed a healthcare proxy. Well, guess what? When you left, they threw it away. They don't save these, right? And by the way, if you had a healthcare proxy which was more detailed, and you went to the hospital and signed one of their forms, by signing that form, you actually revoked your old proxy. So you want to be kind of sensitive to that. So what does it take to have a valid healthcare proxy? You need two witnesses. They can be anybody. Anybody can witness a healthcare proxy. That person, the, once the proxy is signed uh, and your doctor has said you can't make a medical decision, that person can make all your medical decisions for you. The only objection that I have heard to people regarding healthcare proxies, other than I forgot or I, you know, I signed one, and is, oh my God, my daughter can send me to a nursing home if I sign this? Because technically, the decision to go to a nursing home or be admitted to a nursing home is a medical decision. So if your doctor has said you are not capable of making a medical decision, the person with the proxy can technically get you admitted to the nursing home. Except, there is a case on this, if you get to the nursing home with your daughter or your son or whatever and they're trying to put you in and you say, I don't want to be here, um, technically what you just did is you revoked your health care proxy. Even if you're crazy. I mean, even if there, there's no question about whether or not you always have the power to revoke your health care proxy. And at that point, the nursing home is supposed to say, no, I'm sorry, you can't stay. Now, of course, that's great if that's what you wanted was to make sure that health care proxy didn't do that. That's kind of upsetting if you're on the other end of that and you're trying to get somebody into the nursing home because they've got serious dementia problems and they don't want to go. Um, and all I can tell you is usually that resolves itself. I've been doing this now for 39 years and in almost all cases that has somehow resolved itself. But I'm telling you that if it doesn't resolve itself, you have to go, go to court and get that taken care of. Um, as I've just suggested, the person who does the proxy can revoke it at any time. You can always get rid of your proxy, even if your doctor has said that you're not capable of making a medical decision. You always have the right to revoke your proxy. Uh, another little piece about, about um, proxies, that interestingly, and most people don't realize this, the proxy actually survives your death as to one decision, and that is whether to donate some or all of your body uh, to the New England Organ Bank. Uh, which is like a real place. It's located in Waltham. It's the place where bodies go and they take pieces that they need and then they send the rest of it back. Um, if you are really concerned about not having that happen, you should probably put that information in your healthcare proxy. You should probably state that you don't want your body to be, uh, um, uh, uh, or any piece of it to be donated. Interestingly, if you leave any other instructions in the healthcare proxy, like this is how I want to be treated, none of that's legally enforceable. There is no such thing as a binding living will in Massachusetts. In other states, there are. So you may, if you go online, you, it, it looks like they're allowed every place. They're not. So any instructions that you've left in your health care proxy or any place else, totally unenforceable. So the key is, one, to make sure that you know who your proxy is and trust them, and two, that you talk to your proxy about those issues. You may want to write something down as instructions to your proxy, because especially if it's one of your kids and you more have more than one child, 
This may help them in explaining to everybody else what they're doing, right? But none of that is legally binding, okay? Uh, the most form, technically a most form, the significance of the form is not that you've signed it, it's that your doctor has signed it. A most form, once again, Medical Orders for Life Sustaining Treatment, M-O-L-S-T. The most form is a doctor's order, and it's an order to other people down the, the medical food chain, the EMTs and the nurses and all those other folks, that says, here's what you're supposed to do in, the, in these emergency situations. Or more specifically, here's what you're supposed to not do. Because there is a protocol that all these people follow in emergency situations. Somebody comes into your house and you're on the floor. They're going to try to save you, right? That's the protocol. They're going to try to save you. As a matter of fact, it is negligent for them to not try to save you. So they're really going to try to save you, right? Um, so if you don't want some of that saving, then you need to have a doctor's order someplace that says that you don't want it, and that's what the most form is, right? Um, so the most form, once you've done one, uh, you should put it on your refrigerator. And you, well, you say, well, why was it always on the refrigerator? And the reason is that's what the EMT has been trained to do when they walk into your house, if you're on the floor, is look on the refrigerator uh, to see if there's one of these forms. If there isn't, that's the last place they're going to look. I mean, you know, they're in a hurry. You're on the floor. They're there. They've got to make some decisions. So if it's not on the refrigerator, it's, not, it's no good. So you always want to put it on the refrigerator. Remember, your proxy has total control over your medical decisions if you can't make one. So your proxy can always overrule whatever is on the most form, even though it's signed by your doctor, because your proxy replaces you. So if, if you're there, if it's in your house and you're on the floor and your son or daughter is there and the EMT comes in and looks at the most form and says, don't resuscitate, oh, we're not supposed to resuscitate, and your daughter says, oh no, I want him resuscitated because I'm the proxy, that's what they're going to do. They're always follow the rule of the healthcare proxy, okay? Um, some of the decisions that are in the most form, there's the obvious one, CPR. That is, if your heart has stopped, do you want someone to try to make your heart start again? Um, and it may be that you do, but you should understand that, first of all, that is a very painful process, right? It is the process through which they basically have to push through your ribs, mostly usually breaking them, down to your heart to try to make your heart start pumping. So uh, if, if this doesn't bring you back, what it does is it causes you to be dying in an incredibly painful way, you know? So you may want to be taking that risk. It may be important for you to realize, and by the way, you should talk to your doctor about all these things. Your doctors typically don't, have not, haven't been crazy about talking about this, A, because they like to save you. They don't like to, you know, talk about this stuff. And B, because they weren't being paid for it. Uh, until January 1st of this year, Medicare did not pay doctors to have a conversations with you about this topic. That changed as of January 1st, right? So they actually get paid to have this conversation, okay? So, so the question is, do you want to be resuscitated? One of the, one of the I do a, this presentation with, uh, with a, a, a wonderful geriatrician named Michelle Ricard, who lives in Berlin, has practiced in this area for years. She told me of a statistic that she saw that said, if you are over, I think it's 70 years old, uh, and you get CPR, your chances of surviving by more than 30 days are 5%, 5%, 25% chance that they'll bring you back for a little while, 5% chance that you're going to last for more than 30 days. So it's, it's that, so it's that, those are the questions, you want to think about it, you know, because this is your life, it's your body, you're deciding how, in many cases, you're going to be dying, right? So you want to be thinking about it. Or intubation. Do you want intubation in all cases? Intubation means your lungs have stopped breathing and someone has to push a tube down your throat into your lungs to start pushing air in and trying to make the lungs start again. A very, not a fun process. So the question is, do you want that? The one that I always kind of, there are a bunch of other decisions in there regarding whether you want drug therapy, et cetera. The one I always try to emphasize is do not hospitalize. Frank and Mary, don't want to die in the hospital. They want to die in their house and be buried in the backyard. If you don't want to die in the hospital, then your, your healthcare proxy should say, if I'm on the floor, don't bring me to the hospital, right? Because if they, first of all, because that, that's not what you wanted in, in general, but secondly, if you go to the hospital, they're going to save you if they possibly can. 
for two reasons. One, because that's what doctors do, right? Doctors are trained to save people. Um, there's this whole movement now to get doctors to kind of rethink some of this and to be more sensitive to what people really want as opposed to imposing that, imposing life even at a very low quality. There's a guy named Atul Gawande. Uh, by the way, if you want to read a great book about this, Atul Gawande, G-A-W-A-N-D-E, wrote a book called Being Mortal, which has a wonderful, really wonderfully talk about this. So, so, but, so the, the, the question is though, you know, is that what you want? So the doctor's gonna try to save you. The other thing is the hospital wants you to be alive. Um, I remember for many years I was on the board at, at Marlboro Hospital close by, part of the UMass system. Um, and we would have monthly meetings of the board of trustees. And one of, that's one of the things we would always look at for our statistics. How did we do last month? How many people died in our hospital, right? Because if a lot of people die, Oh my God, the Department of Public Health is calling and we're getting calls from the, you know, the special commission in Washington about what's happening in your hospital. So we don't want you to die in our hospital. So you may really want to consider this do not hospitalize if that's what you want. The alternative, as I've mentioned, is guardianship. Um, so you, to, to get somebody appointed by the probate court, that's going to take one to three months, going to cost about $10,000 and it brings out the worst in families. Whereas you can make all these decisions yourself through your healthcare proxy. Power of attorney. The power of attorney gives somebody the power to make legal decisions, whichever ones you want, on your behalf. The power of attorney, as opposed to the healthcare proxy, takes effect right away. It doesn't just take effect when you're disabled, unless you say in your power of attorney that you want it to only take effect when you're disabled. I would suggest that is always a mistake to put that provision in your power of attorney. And the reason is, so the, the attorney, I've used this line before by my wonderful daughter who just got married on Sunday, who is now a big time lawyer, but when she was in high school, she gave me a t-shirt, the good lawyer knows the law, the great lawyer knows the judge. Now in this case, the judge is not like a real judge who knows the law, it's like the person at the bank who is looking at this power of attorney going, ah, is this valid, you know? So you want, you want this document to be, be convincing to all of those other players, insurance agents, et cetera. So does the, does the power of attorney have to be witnessed? No, not in Massachusetts. If you're using it out of state, for example, in Florida, Florida requires two witnesses. We don't. Um, does it have to be notarized? No, actually. Uh, do you want to have it notarized? Oh, ex unless the power of attorney is being used by that attorney or by that agent to sign a deed for you or a mortgage or something that's gonna get recorded in the registry of deeds. That's the only exception. Otherwise, it does not have to be notarized. Do you want it to be notarized? Yes, why is that? I've been doing this, as I say, for almost 40 years. There's something about a notary seal that people see it, they go, oh, this must be a valid legal document. It's got a notary seal. So you wanna get it notarized, not because it means anything, but just because it makes it look more official. Now, I know that sounds like kind of a stupid reason, except the point of it is you want to be able to have a power of attorney that people are going to accept. Um, a couple of things regarding the language in there. One, uh, if you want your attorney to be able to make gifts on your behalf, that's going to be stated in the power of attorney. If you want your attorney to be able to give themselves gifts, even if it's like your spouse, right? That your spouse has the power to give himself some of what you own or herself some of what you own. That has to be specified in there. The reason why I mention that is, so we're going to talk a little bit about mass health a little later on, um, but a lot of the work that I do is with folks who have either got to, who have got dementia or their spouse has got dementia, somebody's got dementia, and we're dealing with nursing home issues. A lot of times that means we need to be reshuffling some assets, transferring assets, a lot of times to the other spouse. And oftentimes that spouse has a power of attorney, but it was generated by an attorney who, by a lawyer who wasn't focusing on this issue, but rather on financial issues. So often there's a clause in there that says, that limits the power to make gifts. That says you can't make gifts to a relative or to yourself of more than the, the, the federal uh, the estate or the uh, gift tax magic number, which I won't go into today, but today it's $14,000. Well, this is a real problem. If I've got one spouse in the nursing home and we're trying to qualify him or her for mass health, and we have to shift all of his or her assets to the other spouse. Because now I got no power of attorney and, and they've got way more than $14,000 and I can't move the assets. Now what do I have to do? Oh, I have to go get a conservatorship. It's the, the, the property version of guardianship. Same thing, three months, thousands of dollars, just a tremendous waste of time. So you need to make sure that you're taking care of that. 
Regarding, um, you can also name more than one person as your attorney, as opposed to the healthcare proxy where you can only name one person at a time because the doctor only wants to have to deal with one person at a time. With the power of attorney, you can name many. So you can name your spouse and your, one of your kids, or you can name all of your kids. You can name them all jointly, if you don't trust them, to make sure that everybody has to sign every time anything happens. Or more commonly, you can name them jointly and severally. The legal consequence of that is that any one of the people that you name can act on your behalf. So that way, if there's somebody out of town, if there's somebody in the West Coast, there's always somebody that can handle things for you, okay? The alternative to this is conservatorship. Three months, bigger three months, fighting, 10,000 bucks. But more than the $10,000, I mean, I'll just give you the case. I'll give you the case from two weeks ago. Wife is in the nursing home, husband's trying to deal with this. I said, yeah, this is very simple. All we're gonna do is we have to transfer all of the assets to the spouse at home, and then the spouse in the nursing home is gonna qualify, except the power of attorney doesn't give him the power to do that. He's got a power of attorney, but it doesn't give him the power, doesn't give him the power to give to himself because he's the attorney. And so it's no good, which means we have to go through a conservatorship in order to do all of this. That's gonna take us three months. It's gonna cost in attorney's fees about $10,000, but more important, they're gonna be, she's gonna be on private pay in the nursing home for those three months, $14,000 a month. So it's the 10,000 in legal fees plus $42,000 in nursing home costs, all because there wasn't this one line in the power of attorney that allowed the gifting. Probate. We talked a little bit about probate already and, and kind of how to avoid it. The point of the probate process, as I say, is to make sure that things that you have left in just your own name end up going to the right person, right? So it only applies to assets in individual names. So in this case, Frank and Mary own those assets the way that they're owned there. If Frank dies, is probate necessary? Anybody, does anybody think that probate is necessary in this case? Uh, if, you, it's, if, you're doing, if you're not raising your hand because you know, then you're correct. No probate is necessary here because the house is owned jointly by the two of them. So when Frank dies, his interest evaporates and Mary becomes the sole owner. There's an IRA that is in Frank's name, but IRAs and 401ks and other tax deferred accounts aren't actually owned by you. You think that they are because you get a statement and it shows all the money that you have, but they're really owned by the entity that has the money except that entity has certain obligations to give you the money if you ask for it, minus the taxes. Um, and so uh, IRAs and 401ks and other kinds of, of, of property, often annuities, have a death beneficiary provision in them that say, that say you can name ahead of time who is going to be the owner of that account after you have died or who is entitled to get the money. So as long as Frank has died and, and, and has an IRA with a death beneficiary for him naming Mary, never passes through his estate. If he forgot to do the death beneficiary, then he's got a problem, the money's all gonna pass through his estate, right? Or this often happens, that there are small insurance policies or accounts like this. One spouse with the other spouse is the death beneficiary, the other spouse dies, and then the surviving spouse forgets to do the new death beneficiary for him and then dies. Now I've got a problem, there's no death beneficiary, everything has to go through probate, okay? So in this case, uh, if Frank dies, um, there would be no probate. If Mary dies, though, uh, then we have a problem because now Mary owns all these assets just in her own name. And when she dies, those assets are going to have to go through probate. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about, first of all, is that a really bad thing? Uh, but we're also just going to talk about, so remember her will said that she wanted to divide things equally among her three children. And the question is, is that what she wanted? And, and or it's certainly what she wanted, is that what is, has she thought this through? And the answer is, that's a fine solution as long as none of those three kids has a creditor problem, right? Or a marriage problem, or a disability problem, or if there's a house. So I'm just gonna talk about that. So if, you leave, if, if they die and they leave, all, leave a third of their assets to Mary, but Mary's got creditor issues, or owes the IRS, or has any of those kinds of things, then basically she's giving the money to the IRS, right? Or to the creditors, because once the money has been inherited by Mary, all the creditors can go chase it. If there's a bad marriage, right? Uh, and and, and that you die and leave assets to your kids, and then that child gets, as, needs a divorce, 
those assets are going to be in play when you're figuring out the divorce distribution. So you end up leaving money to that son or daughter-in-law you never liked in the first place. You know? And then the third case, if there is a disability issue, if one of your children has a disability and, and maybe needing to qualify for a, a government benefit program like MassHealth that is means tested, um, giving them those assets may knock them off the program. And so ironically, you've given them some money, but actually knock them off a program that might be worth a lot more money than what you gave them, right? So in those cases, the standard solution to that is you have a will, which specifies that instead of those assets going directly to the child, the money would go in trust for the benefit of that child. Typically in this case, if you have multiple kids, you name one of your other kids as the trustee for the benefit of the child who has the creditor or the marriage problem or the disability. In that case, as long as that child who has the problem does not have the legal right under the terms of the trust to get that money. None of that money is counted. It can't be in play for divorce purposes. The creditors can't touch it, and it will not cause their qualification for government benefits. Finally, the house. So Frank and Mary really want, when they say they want to give their kids the house, they want to give their kids everything, uh, and therefore also the house, so that it gets divided up, what they really mean, unless they live in like, Martha's Vineyard or Nantucket. I do a lot of work down there where the house, nobody ever wants to sell the house. You want to keep the house, right? But most houses, they're going to get sold, right? And the money's going to get cut up. But if, you, if your will simply says, I'm get, leaving it to my, ch my children, then technically all of the children become the owners of the house. And they each have a share. And if, the, if anything's going to get done with that house, like try to sell it or see if someone's going to live there or the rent or whatever, Everybody has to agree. Everybody has to agree on all decisions. Everybody has a veto. If there's a problem, and if one of them is like not paying the you know, their share of the taxes or whatever, how do you get the money? Good question. You're going to sue them. You know, what, what are you going to do? So the, the way out of that also is this kind of trust mechanism. Often you will, you will say right in the will, or not even the trust mechanism, you'd say in the will, I want my personal representative, the person who used to be called the executor or the executrix, to sell the house and divide up the money. And now you've solved that problem, okay? Um, probate avoidance, can you avoid probate? Well, yes, um, Frank and Mary did regarding their own assets, just simply by making sure that things were held jointly. As long as all assets are held jointly, upon one person's death, the other person becomes the sole owner. Um, if Frank has died and Mary wants to deal with this, um, she could name all of her kids as joint owners with her on all of her property. More commonly, she would take the child that she trusts, right? There's inevitably, there's at least one, there's like a, it's usually a daughter, a designated daughter, right? Who's going to take care of all this stuff. Yeah, the sons are usually useless in this area. Um, and says, well, you know, my daughter, I'm just going to leave, put jointly with my daughter, and she's going to take care of this, right? And she's going to divide up everything. And that's fine. Uh, that, you know, and she can do that and thereby avoid probate. Now, she needs to make really sure that the daughter's really going to do that, right? If she wants to cover herself um, to make sure that that happens, what she could also do in that case is do a very short will and say, my intention is that any asset that I own jointly with somebody else at the time of my death um, is going to be presumptively owned by that person, but it is my hope that they will divide those assets equally among the other people. Right? So that there's a clear instruction to her to kind of be doing the right thing. But the point is, you can avoid probate by just putting everything in jointly. Or, I've talked about this life estate uh, issue. We're going to talk a little more about life estates a little later on. But a, basically what a lot of people do as a, an asset protection matter in terms of dealing with mass health issues is they will keep a life estate in their house. What is a life estate? It's total ownership of the house until you die, the moment of your death. And they would convey out the remaining interest in the property, called the remainder, uh, to either their kids, called remainder men, right? Or to a trust for the benefit of the kids. Uh, and that way they know that upon their, first of all, upon their death, their interest will evaporate, poof, the kids will own the house, and there's no probate necessary. They'll also know that five years after they have done that, um, that's the, the, the value of the house attributable to the remainder interest, which if you're 90 years old is about 90%, um, will be safe in the event that um, uh, the mother, Mary in this case, needs to apply for MassHealth. MassHealth would then put a lien on 
the life estate, but following Mary's, following the mother's death, the life estate, as we say, evaporates, and therefore so does the lien, and then the kids own it lien free. But, but for purposes of probate avoidance, this is just also a device to keep the property from having to go through probate, right? Because typically the other, often, as in this case, you can name death beneficiaries for the other stuff. You can't do that for the house, so you have to do something else. Um, finally, the stuff in the house. Don't you need a will be, to deal with the stuff in the house? Well, in theory, yes. In theory, the stuff in the house, uh, unless you have a will, it has to get divided among the kids, right? And there's no clear solution to who gets what if there's an argument, right? But as a practical matter, right? So I've been doing this, as I say, it'll be 40 years in January. I've never had a case that had to go through probate because of tangible personal property, because of the stuff that's in the house never happens, right? The kids just agree, you know, they figure out how to divide up the property. Now, if you're worried about that, but you want to basically figure you're going to avoid probate and you know that those are the only assets that are going to go through probate, then do a very simple will in which you say regarding my property, this tangible personal property, it is my intention that the children will divide it however they agree and that if they can't agree, my personal representative will figure out how to divide it, right? So then if you die and the only assets that have to, are going to be argued about is this tangible personal property, now your kids have a choice. If someone's going to fight, right, the personal representative can say, well, look, we can, we, can either, we can either just divide up the property, in which case we don't need to go through probate, or we can file a will in the probate court, pay an attorney several thousand dollars, go through this process, have me named as the personal representative, and then we're just going to go divide up the property. So which one do you want to do, right? And inevitably, they opt for not going to probate. So there are, there are those fairly straightforward ways of avoiding probate. The other one that is commonly used, which you've all probably all heard of, is the revocable trust. If I'm Mary and I want to make sure that when I die, that some of this property, specifically the house, this usually applies to the house, is going to get sold and the proceeds divided, then I can right now create a trust, a revocable and amendable trust. So I keep complete control over this trust. Um, I become the trustee, I name myself, and I say right in there, I can sell this property at any time, I can keep all the money, I don't have to deal with my kids, right? But I'll also say that if I die, I'm naming a successor trustee, the, probably the child that was going to be the personal representative, and saying to that person, soon as I die, go sell everything and divide up the money. Now, if Mary does that, then whatever is in trust upon her death does not go through probate, the successor trustee gets appointed the next day and can divide up all the assets. So there is the avoidance of the probate process. There is the, we've talked about regarding the house, you've resolved the issues about the kids fighting about the house because it's just going to get sold and the money's going to get divided up, right? So it's very simple. And during, Ma and during Mary's lifetime, there are no bad tax implications to this. For tax purposes, this trust is so a so-called grantor taxable trust. You don't have to file any special tax returns. Uh, if she goes to sell the property, she still has her, her, her homeowner's exemption. It's exactly if she owns it for, for um, uh, tax purposes. And also for mass health purposes, by the way. So if she then needs to qualify for mass health because she needs nursing home care, as far as mass health is concerned, she still owns this house. And the reason why I mention that is that I very commonly have a situation where I see one of these grantor taxable trusts, a revocable trust that was created by the parents 10 or 15 years ago for probate avoidance purposes, right? And over time, their kids, she's, well, the prison's gotten older and their kids know that this property's in trust and they're all thinking, oh, the property's in trust, so it's safe. And now the mother needs nursing home care and someone shows me the trust and I have to break the news that because this is, that Mary still had control of this trust, therefore, all the assets are countable, including the house. And the only way they become safe is by transferring them out and waiting five years. So I, I mention this to you because you want to make, when you hear the term trust, it's, they're not all the same. This device is a great device to avoid probate. It does nothing for you if you're trying to do asset protection. Which leads me to Mass Health 101. So probably 90% of the people I talk to, among other things, are either, so my cl average client age is 74, right? I love it because they still think I'm young. This is the, one of the things I love about my practice. So, and their issues are typically, they're worried about 
getting all, uh, dementia or, or getting those symptoms. Um, dementia, once again, dementia is not a disease. Dementia is a set of symptoms. Basically, forgetfulness, right? In its later st stages, really serious forgetfulness, like you forget how to brush your teeth or go to the bathroom or do a lot of things. Um, uh, the biggest cause of dementia, the disease that causes the most dementia is Alzheimer's. 70% of, all, of uh, dementia cases are Alzheimer's based, but there were a bunch of others. There's a, th a thing called Lewy body dementia, Parkinson's disease in its later stages often causes dementia. So there are a lot of possibilities. The point is, people are really worried about this because Alzheimer's especially is very age related. So the older they get, the more they worry. So one out of the Alzheimer's Association uses the, the statistic, one out of nine people over the age of 65 has Alzheimer's. One out of three people over the age of 85 has Alzheimer's. So that's kind of what it's about. So people worry about, in that case, so what's going to happen? If they need nursing home care or need a lot of care at home, what's going to happen? Here's Frank and Mary again. Those are their assets. So if Mary today needs to go to a nursing home, um, is Frank going to need to spend down some of those assets before Mary can qualify for MassHealth? MassHealth um, is the Massachusetts name for the Medicaid program. It's the one benefit program that will pay for nursing home care. So in that situation, if Mary goes to the nursing home, does Frank need to spend down money before Mary can qualify for MassHealth? Raise your hand if you think the answer is yes. Raise your hand if you think the answer is no. Ah, so a lot of people aren't sure. The answer is no, actually, in this case. And the reason for that is, oh, I know, and this always amazes people. They come in because they've heard all of those radio shows. Oh, you've got to transfer your assets out. You've got to wait five years. Come in today. So if you're married, there is no, um, first of all, there is no look back period regarding transfers between spouses. So if Mary went into a nursing home today, and Frank came in to me and said, oh, geez, Mary's in the nursing home. We didn't do anything. What do I do? I just tell him. I say, well, first of all, what you've got to do is you've got to transfer all your assets to you, from Mary to you, so that you own everything. And that's perfectly OK. Now, for Mary to qualify for MassHealth, Mary has to have less than $2,000 in countable assets, right? Which, of course, at that point, she does, because everything's been transferred to Frank. Now, there is also a limit on Frank's assets, but no limit on his income. He can have unlimited income. Uh, the limits are Frank can't have more than uh, um, $119,220 in cash or cash equivalent assets. He can own a house, but the house has to have equity of less than $828,000, which in most places outside of Martha's Vineyard and Nantucket is pretty much everybody's house. Right? Um, but most importantly, he can have unlimited income. Unlimited income. So if Mary needed nursing home care, all she would have to do, and she could do it today, as long as Frank had a power of attorney to do it for her, right? Because she can't do it because she's in the nursing home with dementia, right? All she'd have to do is transfer all of her assets to Frank. And then Frank would go out and buy himself an annuity. An annuity for mass health purposes is simply considered to be income, not an asset. As long as um, the annuity calls for equal monthly payments back to Frank over a term that is shorter than his actuarial life expectancy. As long as that's the annuity he buys, he can buy an annuity in any amount and thereby convert uh, a cash accountable asset to a non-countable income stream. We have literally done this and bought million dollar annuities for people. Take a million dollars, buy the annuity, the next day the spouse in the nursing home is eligible for mass health. Okay? So um, in that situation, one of the spouses can always qualify. Right? The problem, though, is what happens, oh, and by the way, if Mary then dies, having been on MassHealth, there's no lien on any of those other assets, right, <clears throat> under current law. The problem is what happens if Frank dies? If Frank dies, given their current estate plan, which is that Mary gets everything, remember? If everything goes to Mary and then goes to the kids. And then Mary needs nursing home care. Or if we've now shifted all the assets to Frank, and because Mary's on MassHealth and then Frank dies and hasn't got an estate plan that has changed and Mary inherits everything, well, now she's off MassHealth because she's got too much in assets, right? So now she's going to have to spend down everything down to $2,000 except the house, at which point she'll qualify, but MassHealth will put a lien on the house and want to get reimbursed for whatever they spent on Mary's behalf after she dies, right? So 
What can they do in that case? So I'm going to, uh, yes. What, they, what Frank can do in that case is he can change his will. And oftentimes, this is what I advise people to do when they worry about this stuff, is that you change your wills now, right? You have both spouses change their wills. And in each case, you say, when I die, I want all assets that would have gone to my spouse to instead go in trust for the benefit of my spouse. It's a testamentary trust, a trust that is part of the will. If Frank did that and made sure that before he died, all the assets were in his name, then upon his death, all those assets would immediately be safe for Mary's, on, Mar for Mary's, on Mary's behalf. The trustee is typically one of the kids, right? And the trustee would have the power to use any of those funds, or if the house were included, to sell the house, turn the house into cash, use any of those funds to supplement Mary's care. But none of those assets would be countable. Mary would be qualified for mass health, and there'd be no lien on any of that money following Mary's death, right? So, so, so they can take care of each other as long as they're both alive. One of the things to remember, though, is you cannot do this and at the same time avoid probate. Because the trust that I just described, the testamentary trust, a trust that is part of the will, has to be part of the will. So in order to do this, you, you need to be structuring your, 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 have your will say that the money goes into trust. You need to make sure that the first spouse to die, before they die, the assets are in their name, which means that at that point there's going to be a probate because the first spouse is dying with assets in their name and the money has to flow through this testamentary trust. So um, that's, the, that's the basic asset protection plan. They would, shift it, they would have wills that have these asset protection trusts. They would also make sure that they had powers of attorney so that if one of them got sick, they would have no problem transferring the assets to the other. Some, in some cases, I've got spouses, especially if there is a big age difference between the spouses, so there's a much greater likelihood that, the older spouse, that one spouse will die, or if there's a spouse that's got serious health problems, specifically heart problems, so that there won't be time to shift assets to that spouse's name before they die. In that case, some case, people will, will stack the assets, put all the assets in the name of the spouse who has a greater likelihood of just dying quickly before things can be transferred. And they'll do that, but they'll understand that if they guessed wrong and the other spouse starts getting sick, they can just transfer all the assets to that spouse before that spouse dies. Um, so now we've talked a little, but what about if they haven't done any of that? and Frank dies, and now Mary owns all the assets. Well, in that case, Mary's only alternative, if she wants to protect any of those assets, is what you've all heard about. She needs to transfer some asset, any asset she wants to have protected, she needs to get out of her name, uh, she can't keep control of it, and she has to wait five years. There are two different kinds of strategies to deal with that stuff. Typically, in the typical case, folk, uh, someone will come in and say they want to protect the house. They're very concerned about losing control over their cash because they want to, they're just worried about it, right? Um, but they want to make sure that the house, or at least the proceeds from the house, are going to be safe when they die, even if they've needed nursing home care. So in that case, typically, they will transfer the house, keeping a life estate. Typically, in this case, Mary would transfer a remainder interest to the three kids and keep a life estate. Or if she's concerned about them arguing over the sale of the property, she'll create an irrevocable trust that she can't get the property back from, transfer the asset to a trustee, to one of the kids as the trustee for the benefit of all of them, keep the, 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 keep the life estate so that she keeps control, nobody can throw her out of the house, right? She keeps responsibility for the bills, et cetera. But then if, once, that, once that transfer has been done, five years from the date on which that deed has been recorded in the registry, the remainder interest, piece of the house is then safe. Regarding her other assets, um, what we had been telling people to do uh, until this recent case that came down was to basically transfer their assets to their kids if they want to make sure the assets are safe, then have the children turn around and set up a trust naming themselves as the beneficiaries so that if Ma needs the money back, one, the trustee will transfer the money to him or herself as the beneficiary and then give it back to Ma. Now, two things about that. One, to do that, you've got to trust your kids. Right? I always tell them, I say, that's why they call them trusts. You're only transferring money into trusts if you trust the trustee. Right? If that doesn't work for you, then you've got a problem. Um, two, this particular device, doesn't that sound fishy? You know, that you could put money into trust and your child is the trustee. 
but your child has the ability at any time to distribute money to him or herself and give it back to you. Well, that was very fishy seeming to um, MassHealth. And so MassHealth over the last several years had been challenging these trusts and had been having some success uh, in having those challenges upheld even in the superior court. Uh, and so we were telling clients more and more, avoid irrevocable trusts because we're just worried about these things getting challenged. But the trust that has the specific provision that I just described, a provision that said that the trustee uh, of the trust at any time could use any of the, could take any of the assets and distribute it to themselves, to any one of the kids, right? Even though the, the kids could then give the money back, that trust just got upheld. Uh, in, in the appeals court, the case is called Hein versus Medicaid, H-E-Y-N versus Medicaid. And it has caused a lot of us to think, finally, this kind of continuing erosion of people's ability to use these trusts is finally uh, uh, at an end, and those trusts are going to be valid. So we're now recommending those again. Now remember, this particular trust, this asset protection trust of Mary's, in which she is shifting things to the trustee and saying either she's keeping a life estate or she's not getting any rights to this stuff, but following her death, she's saying, divide it up among the kids. That trust also avoids probate. The assets that are in that trust, if Mary then dies, avoid the probate process. Okay? I'm going to mention one other thing. This has become less relevant, I, but I've been doing this presentation now for a couple of months. There was a, there is, under current law, if Mary went into the nursing home, in this example that I gave you, Mary went into the nursing home and then she died, um, MassHealth's only claim in that case would be against her probate assets for reimbursement. And since she would need to have shown that she had less than $2,000 when she went on MassHealth, those were never very much, right? Uh, even if she owned a life estate in a piece of property, as I mentioned, if she owned a life estate upon her death, her life estate evaporates, that's not a probate asset now because there's nothing going through probate and therefore MassHealth didn't have a claim. Well, there was a proposal uh, or there is a proposal in the current budget that the governor submitted called Outside Section 11. A, and when you submit a budget, um, a state budget, most of the lines are very, look like a budget. You know, there's a line that says, you know, health care, X number of dollars, and education, and X number of dollars. But those budgets often also have outside sections to them, sections which are really changes in the law, but where the change in the law has a fiscal impact. So this particular outside section would have changed the rules so as to say, that if I were on mass health and I died and I had any interest in property, whether it was a life estate or a joint interest with somebody else, any interest in property, mass health would then have the right to figure out what that interest was worth the moment before I died, and they would have a claim against those assets. More significantly, if I died, if I were Mary and I died and Frank had transferred all the assets into his name, but then he died, MassHealth would have a claim, a claim against the probate assets in Frank's estate, whether he died a week later or a year later or 10 years later or got remarried or anything, right? This was a huge change. It appears that that particular outside section is not going to make it through the budget process, however, because we in the elder law community, I think, alerted a lot of people and we said to people, you know, if you're really interested in this, you ought to call, call your, your rep or your senator, right? And so in the House version of the budget, the House of Representatives version of the budget, this thing is, this outside section 11 has been omitted. And in the Senate version of the budget, which has not been finally voted, but where all of the so-called, the, uh, the amendments to the budget have been voted, outside section 11 has also been eliminated from their budget. So outside section 11 is dead for this year, right? But I, I caution you to keep paying attention to this because the Baker administration has said they will continue to push for this because they think it's a significant revenue enhancer. So just be aware of that. Um, if you have found this just fascinating but I talk too fast and you want to see it again, Frank and Mary have their own YouTube channel and so you can see this show over again. Or if you know somebody that is interested in these issues, you can just tell them that that's where they should look. Uh, and finally, the goal of all of this is to sleep well at night. So if this has caused you any worries and you're worried about any of this stuff, you should deal with it. Otherwise, congratulations. You can just kind of take the day off and wait until next year and see if something else bad happened. So thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed the presentation. We'll see you in the fall if you want to come back. Thank you.